Good evening, and welcome to the St. Paul School Board Candidate Forum. I'm Kitty Goggins, and I'm a league-trained moderator and member. On behalf of the sponsoring organizations, I would like to welcome all of you tonight. The candidates, those who join us live in today's audience, as well as those who are viewing the forum on cable TV or online. The forum will last approximately two hours. We believe the success of St. Paul depends on the values, knowledge, and commitment of our elected officials. Thus, it is essential for the public to better understand the views, opinions, and commitments of people running for elected office in St. Paul. With this understanding, that better equips voters with information to make informed decisions. We appreciate the candidates and the audience members taking time to be here tonight. This year, the citizens of St. Paul are electing four members to the school board. All eligible candidates listed in the Minnesota Secretary of State website as registered candidates were invited to participate in all eight or potentially, I believe we have, we're still missing one, so potentially nine candidates will be appearing here tonight. Each participating candidate has agreed to the forum rules. Each candidate will give a two minute introductory statement the candidates will then have one minute to answer each question and 30 seconds for a rebuttal if necessary. Candidate order for the opening statement and the questions was set using a random number generator. At the end of the question period, each candidate will have two minutes for closing statements in reverse order of the opening statements. We will use questions written by the audience here today, as well as questions that were submitted in advance to the St. Paul League's email. Questions can be written on the index card provided by League volunteers, and we can submit it to League volunteers throughout the forum. Just raise your card when you have one. All questions must be addressed to all candidates, and no personal or attacking questions will be allowed. All questions become the property of the League of Women Voters. Answers to the questions similarly need to focus on the questions themselves. A candidate's record may be discussed, but personal attacks will not be tolerated. A timer uh, will signal candidates when they have 30 seconds remaining by putting up a white 30 second card. And when the timer puts up a red stop card, candidates need to conclude. Candidates, you can finish your sentence, but I will enforce this rule to make sure we give the same amount of time to each of the candidates. We ask that the audience hold all applause until the end of the forum this evening. Now let me introduce the candidates for the School Board of St. Paul that are participating in the evening uh, in alphabetical order. Chantil Allen, if you wanna raise your hand so people can see. Uh, Charlie Castro. Zuki Ellis, Tiffany Fearing, I don't believe is with us this evening, Jessica Kopp, Steve Marchese, um, sorry, St Steve Marquesa, forgive me, um, Jennifer McPherson has a statement to be read. Unfortunately, she had an ill child and was unable to be here, and Omar Syed, and Ryan William. We now begin with the opening statements. Remember, candidates, you have two minutes for each response. Steve Marquesa, you're first. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here today and for participating and listening to us. Uh, this is an important day to be able to hear from all of us, and I want to thank you for taking your time out to do this. I'm Steve Marchese. I am a parent. I'm a resident of the city of St. Paul. I'm a public service lawyer, and I'm a member of the St. Paul School Board. And I joined the board four years ago um, at a time when this district was going through a lot of profound leadership and internal crisis. Uh, and during this time, we have really been working very hard as a board, and I'm very pleased as a member of the board to have seen us grow as a board, grow in terms of the ways that we're approaching our leadership and make some really important changes and choices as this uh, district has grown and changed over the years. Um, when I think about how we have had to make some of these tough choices, um, I'm pleased about some of the decisions that we've made and I know that we have a lot more work to do. Um, as someone who has my own child who is a junior at Central High School and a recent graduate of Central, um, I know how important it is, how much our families depend on our school district, how essential our school district is to the functioning of our city. And in times like this, when we know 
that we're dealing with random acts of violence in our community and a lot of pain, that our school districts are a refuge and a place where our kids can grow and change and develop and be the kind of people that they want to be, and that's the future of our city. As someone who has worked in public service law, I work with clients who are coming from places and spaces where they have been in deep need. A lot of those families are the families that are the families of our children. And we need a school district that's going to be reflective of their culture, that's going to give them the best shot that they have to be able to be successful, and is going to be the kind of place that's going to prepare them for the future. I'm excited by the leadership that we have in the district. I'm excited by the strategic plan. And I'm excited by the opportunity to, work, to, to talk to you tonight about the opportunities that you have as a member of this community to support this district and to support our city in being the kind of place that you want it to be. So thank you for being here, and I look forward to talking more with you. Thank you. Now we have Charlie Castro. Good evening. My name is Charlie Castro, and I'm running for St. Paul School Board. I remember when I was young, my parents told me I could be whatever I wanted. And that was furthered by the fact that my teachers told me the exact same thing. Now, imagine what that does to a child. For a while, I was a teacher, and then I was going to be a chef maybe an artist or a painter. Today, I am none of those. But the opportunity to envision one's dreams and to follow wherever that takes us is powerful, and I think you would agree with that. I'm running for St. Paul School Board as a concerned citizen that lives in Lower Town. As a professor of Minnesota State, I teach at both Century College and at North Hennepin Community College, and I realize that education is fundamental and education is powerful. With a good education, you can get out of poverty. You can chase your dreams. You can travel the world. You really can do whatever you want. But without a good education, you're lost and you can't do much. I think that not allowing our students to be able to follow the dreams the way my parents and my teachers told me that I could and that I believed that I could is one of the most fundamentally heinous things that we can do for our youth today, and that needs to change. I believe that children need services, and that they shouldn't have to go looking for them, that we should be able to provide them in the schools that they are educated in. I believe that teachers need resources to be able to teach the class room lessons that they want to engage their students and keep them active in that particular lesson. My name is Charlie Castro and I'm running for St. Paul School Board. I look forward to talking with you this evening about some very serious issues facing St. Paul, our students, and our faculty. Thank you. Next we have Chantel Allen. <clears throat> Good evening. Thank everybody for coming here today. Um, excuse my voice, but We've got a lot going on in our city right now, and I'm usually involved in a lot of it, so my voice usually takes a toll on that. Um, I was born and raised in the city of St. Paul, and I went to school here in St. Paul. I graduated from St. Paul Central. Immediately, I started working in the St. Paul Public Schools uh, in a position I was working in community ed, and, and I was I was working under somebody who was really kind and, and positioned me in a way that allowed me to see things on the broader spectrum of what was going on across the city. So I was working in community ed and I was able to see how the parks and recs and the schools could work together to make things happen. I, I continued to work in, uh, moved into the classroom and working into the special ed. And I, I started to realize that we had some real problems going on. And I tried to address some of those things. When, when I was falling to deaf ears, I left the district and, and ended up at Hennepin County Child Protection where I learned more skills around working with families and children and how to support some of the problems that we were seeing in our, in our state. And, and just let's be frank, we have, we have a serious disparity issue going on with our African-American families here in St. Paul. And, and so getting both pieces of that, I started to formulate these theories around what we needed. And in meantime, I was at Metro State obtaining an African-American studies and psychology degree. So I was able to take the, the book information and apply it to the work that I was doing. About seven years ago, I stepped back into the St. Paul Public Schools because this is my home. St. Paul is my home, and I needed to come home. After working in child protection for so many years, dealing with that level of trauma, you, you, you start to 
um, realized that it pays a toll on you, I needed to come home. And so I just, um, I came back. And I started to apply some of these skills to spaces that I was in. I was working in a one-to-one -one with a kid who was highly uh, uh, traumatized and was able to regulate them right away. And so I moved into Ramsey Middle School and we can talk about some of the changes. Thank you. Next we have Jessica Kopp. Hello, okay. I'm not great with microphones, so this will be my practice run. Uh, hi, my name is Jessica Kopp, and I'm the parent of a sixth grader in St. Paul Public Schools. Uh, she's been in St. Paul Public Schools since kindergarten. We actually chose the school closest to our home. It was four blocks away, and it's the best decision we ever made. Uh, that choice, in addition to loving the school, it created in me and in our family a deep love for our community and the work I've done with uh, community partnership building and organizing. Um, as a result of some needs in our school, we looked at what we could do as a community to support families because kids are in families first. And so we wanted to um, look at developing a full service community school model in our school. We applied for a state grant. We received $135,000 from the state to start a full service community school. And when the money ran out, we um, built community partnerships to sustain it. Because we know if families are stable and well cared for, kids will be too. And then we can unlock um, their passions and their knowledge much easier. I've also been a part of developing um, an innovative school redesign program at Hamlin Elementary that will be, when it's completed, uh, will be the first of its kind in the region. It's the kind of program redesign that's typically reserved for uh, private schools and charter schools, but we did it, in here, did it here in St. Paul Public Schools. And so I know what's possible in St. Paul Public Schools. I've been to a lot of board meetings, board members here can testify to that. Like I've, I've been there and so I understand the process, I understand the procedures and I have the patience, um, the expertise, the energy and the love for the work. Um, having once upon a time, I think I forgot this, been a um, high school and middle school English teacher um, to do this work with a lot of love and energy. And, um, and it's not just about me doing this, it's about us doing this. So I'd like your vote hopefully on uh, November 5th and your partnership afterward to work for St. Paul Schools. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Omar Saeed. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank you that uh, uh, everyone is here tonight. And uh, my name is Omar Saeed, and I'm running St. Paul School Board. Um, I was born in Somalia, left that country in 1991 uh, when civil war broke out. And I moved to the Kenya and uh, were at a refugee camp. Uh, I lived there almost uh, six six years, and I moved to the Minnesota, uh, St. Paul, in 1997. Um, I went to the high school in St. Paul, and I graduated in Arlington, and uh, I went to the uh, Century College where I received my certificate of uh, uh, health professional. And I have a, a, a business in St. Paul, Eastside, and where we opened in 19, uh, 2008, there, where we opened this coffee shop there. And uh, uh, my, I live in St. Paul, and I have a family, and I have a kids who go to St. Paul Public School, and which is a Como Elementary. Um, I am running St. Paul School Board because of um, um, we want to St. Paul School um, serve our our all community, and we just want to make sure that um, our community, uh, um, St. Paul Public School, serve all community and also. Um, uh, educa educational um, gap that um, um, concern all the immigrant and community. And we want to attack that one. And also that um, uh, to make sure that um, um, uh, all uh, the teachers, the color of teachers uh, hired at St. Paul Public School. And I look forward to seeing you on November 5th. And um, well, I'll thank you so much. Thank you. Ryan Williams. Good evening, thank you for coming. My name is Ryan Williams. Thank you for all attending and listening to the ideas we all have to share. Um, thanks for all the candidates for bringing their ideas and dedicating so much time to this. Um, I'm running up for the board because I would like to advocate the needs for some of our students. I am very interested in some policy updates. I'm a formal, former student who is enrolled in special education as a pre-K uh, 12, uh, 12th grade student. 
and I work in special ed with special ed students. I am currently employed in the Minneapolis Public School District. I work in a couple different schools in a few different roles. I move around a lot. I have an, a citywide position. Um, and I just really want to update some policies. I want to be there for our needs of our students and our staff and our families. I'd like to update some of our um, restraint policies. I've had some families concerned since the um, seclusion room policy ended that there have still been seclusion rooms used or that this has caused an increase in restraints. So I'd like to make sure all of our policies are up to date. I'd like to make sure that we are documenting every restraint that happens, whether the student is special ed or not. We need to be able to keep records of this, have accurate records, make sure we are um, uh, recording this comparably to other large districts of our size. Um, it's very important that we you know, respect the rights and needs and safety of our students and as well as our staff. I'm very concerned in um, keeping our transportation safety. Uh, there's a couple policies I, I'd like updated there. I'm very interested in making sure we have something in place for what our bus monitors. Uh, bus monitors, they help students with needs trans, uh, transport themselves on the bus. And it's very important we have this policy in place. It's been required since 95. I want to make sure we have that. I want to make sure we have our um, school transportation safety director designated. So I just want to kind of update our policies, be an advocate for parents with special needs students or all students who have needs or services that should be updated in the policy. I want to be a liaison and a contact option for the community. Thank you very much for your time. My name is Ryan Williams. Thank you. And Zuki Ellis. Good evening. My name is Zuki Ellis, and I'm currently serving on the school board as the board chair. I have a sixth grader in middle school. I um, have a whole lot of feelings about middle school. Um, excitement, mostly, because this is a huge transition for our students, um, and especially um, because we changed our middle school model a few years back. Um, I would just like to say I have been in every single one of our schools, and they are all very different. And when we talk about addressing needs of students and advocacy for them and supporting their parents, I think that it really, that really means you have to understand the community in each one of our schools. And when we're talking about supporting schools as a whole, that means that some of our schools aren't getting the same things and that's problematic as well too. And so um, when I, initially decided to run for school board, I had my oldest son who really struggled in St. Paul Public Schools, and I knew I did not want that experience for my younger child. And so that prompted me to take training with um, PACER, who does advocacy work on behalf of families who um, have students who have learning differences and disabilities. And that work led me to what happens if we have someone who understands special education law and procedures and idea that they are advocating at not just a parent level, but advocating in a way that helps create and change policy in this district. And that is big and heavy work and it creates a lot of hoops and obstacles for our families to navigate in this district. And so it is my privilege to serve on this board. I grew up in St. Paul schools. I am a graduate. My children are going to St. Paul Public Schools. I believe that this is my purpose, and I am very passionate about it, and there are so many possibilities here. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer McPherson had planned on being here this evening, but her child is in the ER, and she asked us to state that she is for equality, anti-bullying at all levels, and working with families to make their experience with St. Paul Public Schools enjoyable. Every student, staff member, and family matters. So having completed the opening statements, we'll move to our questions, and candidates have one minute to answer these questions. The first question, what is your philosophy in working with the board and administration to get things done? And first we have Ryan Williams. So I repeat the question, what is your philosophy in working with the board and administration to get things done? I think knowing the expertises and skills of the other um, board members is a big help. I've had uh, uh, been recommended by other uh, candidates for people to, with concerns about disabilities and restraints. They said check with Ryan. So it's really great that there can be a team of people with different specialties and each board member can take on certain roles and certain focuses. Um, it's very good to be that um, advocacy in your special field. 
Um, so I think that's really great. It's a good opportunity to take on different roles for different board members. I think a lot of accountability is important, um, you know, when there needs to be more oversight of certain budget issues. Like we have with construction, we can have the board take on that role and update any policies as needed to allow for better oversight of what's going on in the district and administration. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Jessica Cobb? So in a, a lot of my work in the last four years as an organizer, spending a lot of time at board meetings, spending a lot of time building partnerships with the school district, with administration, I've had some experience doing this. And what I've observed, there's a couple things that help. Uh, Ryan alluded to one, which is kind of knowing who's good at what, who has what knowledge. No one person holds all the information. And to really understand that we need to be kind of a collaborative working unit. We can't be fighting. We can't be setting each other up to fail. We really have to be making each other better. And if we're not communicating, if our um, purposes are not aligned and clear, um, that makes that challenging. So I think be, having open, honest communication is really important. To work in good faith, assume that everyone's trying to do a good job, that people want to see kids be successful. It's like if things aren't going right, it's not necessarily um, about blaming and finding fault. It's saying, this is a problem, let's, let's, let's reverse engineer it and let's find out what does this person need, what does this situation require for things to be better. And then if it's the case where someone is just not good at what they're doing, then maybe changes are made. Thank you. Omar Saeed. Um, yeah, um, it's always communication is better. Um, we need to communicate uh, when we communicate each other and uh, um, everything goes well. And uh, as a community organizer and uh, business owner, um, I will bring my experience there to communicate on all board members and uh, to uh, make sure that um, that work that um, that our community elected um, that has to be done. You know, everything has to be. We have to be same page all all of us. And um, um, when I'm, you know, we if if we're not same page, then nothing will be done there. So we'll make sure I'll make sure that it has to be everything is done there. Thank you. Mizuki Ellis. There was what I thought this job was and then what it actually is to be in it. And um, communication is completely ongoing. Um, I think that that is a struggle that we have because it is communicating across our community and that is really difficult because you have press that is communicating, district who is communicating, and then we have people's experiences within our building and trying to make sure that everyone is, one, getting the same information, but that it is accurate information and important in the moment and able to help us guide um, decisions. I think one of the things that have been really helpful being on the board is that opportunity to get to know my colleagues on the board. Um, even though we might all have different interests, ultimately our goal is to do the best work for students and our um, people who work in St. Paul Public Schools. And so while our own interest may help guide some of the things that we do in districts and in the district and our roles, ultimately we do have to come together to work for our community and our students. Thank you. Steve Marchese. Thank you. I think um, a few things that I would add, some of the things that other folks have said. Um, the board is an ultimate is the ultimate collective. It's a this is a, a team sport. Nobody does it all by themselves, and so I think one of the things that it's been important to me as I've been on the board is for us to build the kind of culture where we can actually play to our strengths. And I've said to my colleagues, "What is your superpower, and how can we work to make sure that that is the thing that you are doing?" Um, and making sure that we are allowing each other to be able to operate in the space where we can be the strongest. Because as a collective, we have to be having all of the things and the strengths that we need. As someone with legal training, and I will confess as a, someone who was born in New York, um, I'm actually not very embarrassed about raising issues that seem to be the elephant in the room. And so for me, yeah. it's important to have someone on the board who is 
willing to ask tough questions, willing to use the analytical part of their minds to be able to do that. It's part of my legal training. Others have it as well, but I think this is something that I brought. Um, and I think an accountability culture is really important as well. So we, we guide the superintendent, but we need to be clear in our guidance at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. Chantelle Ellen? So I think relationships are important, and that's something that I think I'm really good at. Um, I, I have a tendency to build really good relationships with teachers who don't have a good, do a good job at getting along with students or having good outcomes in their classrooms and giving them a really good perspective about how we need to teach today's children. And um, I've, I've, it's been difficult, but I've gotten it. And I think I can apply that skill on an administrative level and start to build some relationships and also bring the voice of my constituents along with the parents, the teachers, the students, to the, to the upper admin and actually um, have, have that representation. Also, accountability, that's always important. You know, I think making sure you know, that we're holding everybody. Everybody does, is, a, is really the expert at what they do, but we have to hold them accountable to do the best job possible because it's, it, all, it all trickles down and affects our students. And so we need to make sure that everybody is doing, the, doing it to the best of their ability and making sure that the pieces of their job that affect our students are getting done because I'm seeing it on the ground, so. Thank you, Charlie Castro. Uh, I think in order for a group to work well, we have to collaborate, which always sounds like a good idea, but sometimes that collaboration can be messy because we all come with different perspectives and different ideas and different ways about doing things. And so when I teach my students communication, I always tell them that being able to speak in front of people or have a group discussion is not about turning everybody to your side, right? That you won the debate or you won the speech, right? But Good communication means that everybody on the team listens, whether they agree with you or not, and that at the end of that conversation, however long or how many days it takes, right, that we all come to a consensus about what might be right for a particular school or a group of students or, in this case, the district. Thank you. So we'll move to question two. And this one, just to give you a heads up, Omar, you will be first. Um, what action do you support to address the achievement gap? Sitting. Sorry. Yes, you're first. Okay. What was the question? I'm sorry. sorry. It's what action will you support to to address the achievement gap? You said achievement gap. The achievement gap. Achievement. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, to me, is as a. Um, immigrant and uh, as a, um, um, when I moved to in here in Minnesota and uh, in St. Paul, um, for those who are immigrants and some of them doesn't know the, the language. And uh, St. Paul, we have a lot of immigrants here. And, and uh, most of them, um, their parented um, don't speak English. And, um, but the kids go to school and uh, when, Kids go to school and come back and get the homework and to the uh, parent. Um, parent, uh, the kids cannot get, cannot get help. And so I am supporting um, to um, after a school program that families can learn English and that and can help their students. Um, otherwise, our, our the, the immigrant kids uh, don't achieve achieve their goals. Thank you. Jessica Kopp. So to address the achievement gap, it's, it's obviously, it's hard to talk about it in one minute. All of the priorities that I have listed on my literature are all geared towards achievement gap. I'm just gonna focus on one, and that is um, d committing to supporting uh, diverse and innovative teaching and learning. And so that means diverse education force, that means innovative teaching practices. Uh, we've been doing the same thing for many years um, with less money for different, for different kids. Our world is different too. And so we have to be prepared to look at what, what the world is now and what kinds of teaching changes we can make. And part of my experience at Hamlin Elementary is working with staff to do this very kind of work. So I know it's possible. What I think is, 
what often happens is there's educators who have really great ideas, really strong views on maybe changing curriculum or changing their practices, but they're not well supported to do that, and they end up leaving the district and going elsewhere. I imagine a world where we can say, you stay here, you support that, and I think then we're gonna start to see some movement and some changes that benefit students. Thank you. Chantel, Allen. So I'm a straight to the point kind of person and I'm just gonna keep it real. Um, as much as I love Obama, the real is no child left behind, left a lot of kids behind and we're dealing with a serious literacy issue because kids were just passed along without, the, without them being taught to read appropriately. Um, that is a real problem. And I believe that bringing the trades back into the schools, we can give them some skills and they can, they can extend their, their literacy education beyond 18. If we don't give them some sort of skills at 18, they'll be stuck. But we have to give them a way to make some money so that they can go to continue their education and become productive pieces of, the, of society. Our baby boomers are you know, retiring out of these union jobs and they're in, in mass amounts and we need to fill those positions and we need to start giving our kids some, some opportunity to make some money. And that's, that's just the reality of it. Thank you. Zuki Ellis? Right now we currently measure um, achievement through MCA test and they're racially biased. Let's just call that out right now. And I think a lot of, I think a lot for me, a lot of the issues are that we don't see brilliance in our kids. We tell them all the things that they cannot do, and we do not find any other way to define the things that they can do. And that is on the adults, that is not on our kids. And even calling it an achievement gap or an opportunity gap, that is our neglect of our own children, and we need to own that and call that out. And it is the reason to do this. It's the reason to sit up here and say, you want to be a part of changing that. It is about creating opportunities for our students. And to that point, yes, there are many opportunities in the trades where they can start making two years after they graduate more money than most of us make in this room. And so do not sleep on our kids. They are brilliant. And this test does not define who they are. Thank you. Charlie Castro? Uh, I think the achievement gap is a multi-pronged issue that faces St. Paul School. I think one of the main reasons that there is an achievement gap is because we deal with uh, misconduct of some students more differently than we deal with it on others based on their skin color. Um, I think we need to recruit more teachers into St. Paul schools that look like the students that actually attend St. Paul schools. Uh, when I was a kid, the teachers looked like I did. And so I thought, oh, I could be that, or I could do that. I could be something great. And the way in which that we uh, instruct our students, the way that we're able to engage them as teachers, the way that they were able to make schools uh, a learning place, uh, a hub essentially for connection and relationships uh, will help that achievement gap. But we can't get there by one thing, right? There's a lot of different things that feed the achievement gap. And I think we need to start with all of those in succession to get our students to where they need to be. Steve Marchese. Well, we could talk for hours about the topic and I think it's critical and so critical, I think we have to recognize that the issue of the achievement gap is really based upon some of the structural racism that's in our system that is part of how our system is organized, the basis upon how our system is organized and the way our society treats individuals in the society and in groups. And if we don't address the, um, the unconscious bias that we have in the way that we've set up the system, it's gonna be a long haul. But I do think to do it, we need intentional action and the intentional action, some of which I think you see in some of the strategic plan work that the district has done, it has to be instructional. We need to think about how we're working with our kids. We need to think about the relationships that we have between our students and the adults in the room. 
Our community needs to wrap itself around our kids. We need to support our kids. We need to provide the opportunity to give them mentorship, to bring in mental health services, to get them connected to the different resources that they need so that families can be supported so their kids can succeed. And I also think we need to think about resources. We have deep funding inequities in our state and in our community, and we need to address those. And those are the kinds of things that we've been working on and we need to continue to work on. Thank you. Ryan Williams. One thing I'd like to do to help with the achievement gap is to consider it more of an opportunity gap of we're not giving the students all the opportunities they need. Um, a great hiring pool for a wide range of diverse candidates would be the Metro State Urban Education Program. While I was attending there, me and a lot of my classmates, we had a tough time finding placements to volunteer in St. Paul Public Schools. So we would go to Minneapolis for volunteer practicum hours, student teaching, and then we apply and work at Minneapolis Public Schools. So by allowing more volunteer opportunities, creating those opportunities, we can get a great hiring pool of people that represent our students straight from Metro State. Another important thing I'd like to do is um, make sure we're giving our students the correct services they need. Um, we do some third party billing. I'd like to make sure that we're giving students the accurate services they need when we're billing for them and claiming the hours, make sure they get the hours they need. Uh, and also consider the needs of our students who might be underrepresented. We have the uh, Mendota, Middlewakanton, Dakota community. They're a local uh, Dakota community from this area. They're not put on a tribal reservation, so they don't have federal recognition. So we don't include them in the state curriculum, but I'd like to include them in the St. Paul curriculum. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving to our third question. What are the most important metrics to judge how St. Paul's school district is doing by those measures, how is St. Paul doing? And the first person we have on this one is Jessica. Can you repeat the question, please? Certainly. What are the most important metrics to judge how St. Paul Public School District is doing? By those measures, how is St. Paul doing? Um, measurement in education is kind of a tricky business. Um, as we've heard, standardized testing and I agree is not the ultimate or the only assessment. It's, it's a piece, it's a part. Um, if it's not understood in the context of other things, it, it's um, not as helpful as it could be. So if we just took that, we could say, there's a ton of work to do. And I think we shouldn't discount it, but we shouldn't overinterpret the results of that. And that there's definitely opportunities to improve. And if we don't measure, then we don't know where we're starting. And so we, all, we have to have that, but we also have to contextualize as a, as a teacher. Um, I would do assessments with my kids because I needed to know where they were so I knew what to teach them. Um, so I didn't have to guess and I didn't have to uh, cover things that they already knew or start too far ahead. And so our so metrics have to be um, context contextualized. Um, and I think I'm, nope, oh, I'm good, okay. If we go by what parents think, it's mixed. It kind of depends on where you go to school and people's experiences vary. And so having a, a proper metric for measuring uh, family and student satisfaction, um, I think we've yet to hit on that. Thank you. Thank you. Steve? I, I completely agree with what Jessica said about the difficulty of coming up with measurements and metrics, because numbers, what you choose to measure and is what you choose to focus on. And I think we have focused very heavily on the uh, proficiency numbers for things like the MCA. I do think we need to be looking at the growth and how our students are doing year over year because that really measures the ways that they're actually changing over time and also to look at how we're making progress in the way that both growth and proficiency are closing related to race and related to ethnicity and special ed. Um, I think we want to take a look at where our graduates are going. College and career is really basically what we're trying to prepare our students for. Are our students able to get co into college? Are they able to get into a career that they want? Are they taking remedial courses? How many of them have been able to take advanced courses? Um, I think another th other things to look at are attendance. Are students showing up every day? Look at the disciplinary statistics. Are we making progress to close some of the disciplinary gaps based on race, based on special education status? Our district has a lot of work it needs to do. We're not there yet, and we need to continue to work hard. Thank you. Zuki? How is the district doing? The district could always be doing better, right? Um, and that is multi-layered, right? That's not just students, that is the organization itself, 
right? And is the organization itself set up to support students? And so if I think when, when we're talking about measurement and metrics, that is what I'm doing. Is the district currently set up supporting students? And I think that the strategic plan is the blueprint, the blueprint for how the district is going to do its work. But I think that the blueprint is really very complicated to try to follow, is it actually doing what it needs to do? And how are we sharing that out to community? And so um, I think it also, I think it, it is complicated as, as I'm thinking about it as parent, because I am worried about how is my child doing in the environment he is, that he is in, but what does that look like across the district? And because our schools are so different, how are our families decide, understanding what success means for not only them, but the school as a whole? Thank you. Charlie? Okay. That's right. All right. <laughs> uh, I think the way that we measure um, how St. Paul schools are doing um, is through a lot of different input channels. So if we think of St. Paul School Board as kind of the hub, there are a lot of spokes that feed that hub, right? There are parents, there's community, there's teachers, there's paraprofessionals that deal with students on a regular basis. And I think not just looking at that test score is gonna give us a full picture of what's going on inside our school or schools, and it's not gonna allow us to truly measure how students are affected by what we're doing at those schools. So I think we need some engagement from parents, from community members, from the teachers, from individuals that meet with those students, whether they might be psychologists or therapists or counselors. Um, we need all of that to create one set of metrics that allow us to help our students to reach whatever achievement that they want, to better St. Paul schools and in turn better the district and the school board itself. I think without that multi-layered that Zuki was talking about, I think we miss, we miss the, the uh, subject of really being able to cater to each student and in the schools that they are. Thank you. Omar? Well, um, how are we doing in St. Paul? Our uh, St. Paul districts, and um, we are, uh, um, I believe we're missing a uh, um, few things that um, to add it as, as a district and uh, to communication with the community. Um, also, um, how are we doing to, uh, how about the, uh, the MCA test? And the test that um, are we, uh, how many kids that graduate every year? And uh, how many uh, kids go into high school? How many uh, kids go on the college? And, uh, we need to figure out on, on what level they are. And um, communication always um, better to communicate to the community. And, uh, um, and also, how we doing to um, um, uh, testing scores. Um, um, we need to figure out that one too. And, uh, and um, also that um, um, communication to uh, the teachers and how the how 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 they teach our students. So we need to just communicate all. Thank you. Ryan. Thank you. I think a good metric for judging how, how we're doing in the district is uh, retention of students, staff, families. Um, I think we're very lucky we have current and former employees that are running for the school board. So we do have the ability to attract staff that are dedicated and committed. Um, on their personal time to make the district better. We need to make sure we are giving them the opportunities to do that and give them the power, the resources to do that and not burn teachers out and not push them away. That's great, we have that dedication. I think we need to harness that from the employees of St. Paul. We need to see where we're keeping our employees, what, how we're keeping our employees and just focus on keeping employees. They know the students better. They know siblings, there's a lot of families with five, six, seven kids and the teachers know the family because they've had every kid in their classroom. So keeping the teachers in is important. Keeping the families in is important. We want families to feel comfortable, be happy, continue returning to our school instead of choosing other districts, charters, or private schools. We want to keep our students coming to these schools. They want We want the staff to be there to help that stay. Um, I think just retaining everybody we can and making everybody feel happy and a part of the team. Thank you. Chantel? 
Um, I think the metrics, I like, I, I like that word, but uh, the metrics is the graduation rates and the enrollment. That's the, that's the basic. And then I'm going to agree with Charlie that, you know, if we were going to do a, set up a system, it needed to be centered around community. Um, I want to add in also students. We really need to hear the students' voice because they know how they're doing in school and they know where they want to go in life. And <clears throat> I know in my day, people told me what we were going to do. But I've been working with these kids for a while, man, and they know where they're going and they know what they want to do. So if we're not educating them appropriately, they'll let us know. But also teachers really do care about their kids and they are given assessments on a regular basis so that they know that they're teaching to the children. And so if we were setting up a system where we could hear from teachers, paras, students, um, parents, and then also adding in enrollment and graduation rates, I think we would come up with some, some really accurate numbers about what's going on with our schools. Thank you. We'll move to our next question. Um, do you have any concerns regarding the expansion of charter schools within St. Paul Public Schools? And this time we'll start with Ryan. The question again, do you have concerns regarding the expansion of charter schools within St. Paul Public Schools? Um, I do believe it could be a challenge if we lose too many families to charter schools. That's less funding for us. A big concern of mine for charter schools is the billing. Um, they have the ability to bill the districts for special education services. That's a big bill, and specifically special education transportation services are heavy bills from charter schools to public school districts. Um, we do have a little bit of power there. The, there are some abilities for the school transportation safety director to set some regulations for the transportation of public and non-public and public charter schools. Um, we can be competitive. Uh, it's, we're, gonna re, we're, we're low on bus drivers. We need a lot more bus drivers. And by being competitive and keeping the bus drivers working with Minneapolis or St. Paul Public Schools, we can be competitive and keep our keep our students, keep the staff, and we can have a better transportation option by being better and kind of more competitive and not losing drivers, students, and other staff to the uh, charter schools. Thank you. Uh, Jessica? So I will, uh, I'll agree with Ryan that one of the issues with the billing is that that's a space where um, the, the existence of charters does take money out of, of St. Paul Public Schools. And so I know that that's something that is, um, I think, in progress at the board or at the district level right now is to, to do some work um, with the state um, to make that more, more fair and equitable. Um, I think it's important to understand the relationship between charters and um, SPPS in that why are people choosing them? I think that's one of the best things we can do is understand why people leave, why do they go there? And then to leverage our size as a school district, um, some things that people like about charters, I mean, there's a million reasons, but one, it's, it's small and it feels navigable. Like, I know who to talk to, I know where to go. Whatever else might be going on, people sometimes feel like it's easier to navigate. Um, but in a large district, you can um, leverage your size with partnerships and opportunities. If you think about what's available in St. Paul Public Schools, it's pretty spectacular. From immersion programs to Montessori programs to technical programs, science programs. And so I think understanding that's important. Um, yeah, we'll just, we'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Zuki? I think that St. Paul is aware that charter schools are other options for our families if they feel like they don't find a fit within St. Paul. And I think in the fall, just this month, there are 13 charter schools opening, and three of those are in St. Paul. And it isn't just St. Paul that is trying to contend with how they keep their districts afloat while all of these charter schools are popping up. It is across this entire state. And I'm not going to tell any family who has taken their child out of St. Paul that they didn't do what was best, but it does have an impact on St. Paul Public Schools and their ability to do some of the things that they want to do. And to that point of the cross subsidy around special education, we cover that for the charter schools and as well as transportation. So 
if it wasn't taking from us, I would be like, yeah, okay, let's figure out the ways that we can support families in our community, but it takes from us and that makes it hard. Thank you. Steve? So we've had charter schools and school choice for over 25 years in the state of Minnesota, and at what point do we ask the question whether this system is actually providing us with the kind of outcomes that we want to see? Are we closing gaps? Are we decreasing segregation? Do we have more equity? Do we have the kind of system overall, not only just in public schools, but with charter schools that we can say to every child that you will get a quality education regardless of who you are, where you are, or who your parents or your caregivers are. We don't, we don't do any of this as a state. And that's very troublesome when you consider who our children are in St. Paul. Charter schools are an option and everybody loves choice because it's like mom and apple pie and Chevrolet. But the reality is choice has costs. I've written about this, it was published in the Star Tribune as an op-ed about five months ago. It is very important that we open up our eyes and think clearly about what choice and charters do. For some families, particularly families of color, it's been a met, an important way for them to get a proper education for their kids. But we need to question why that is the option and why that is the way it has to be. Because every child deserves to have a quality education and charters undermine that. Thank you. Charlie? Uh, whenever I hear the word charter, it always sounds like the seven letter swear word. Um, it always has this very bad connotation, but for some families, it is the right choice. And I think we do need to look at the funding issue, but I think more importantly, we need to look at the relationships that those charter schools are building with those communities and those parents and those teachers and those students because they're doing something right. That's why those students and those parents and those teachers are moving to those charter schools. And I'm not saying get rid of charter schools because I think there is a place for them. But I'm saying if they're doing something good and we could improve on the policies or the practices that we as St. Paul School Board needs to impart to our students across multiple schools, then we need to fess up to the fact that maybe we're doing something wrong and we could do something better and we're gonna take a little bit of what these charter schools are doing in their own communities and we're gonna help our own students here as they attend public school inside St. Paul. Thank you, Chantel. <clears throat> yeah, I'm definitely concerned about the expansion of charter schools. Um, but again, I'm more concerned about why. And why this is not a new issue and this is not a new concern. This is not something that is just recently brought to the district and said, hey, we need more culture in our schools. We need to make them more community-based. They had a lot of concerns and their, their voices just weren't being heard. And so they moved and that's what happens. Um, I would like to see our schools rise to that level where people don't want to leave, where our enrollment is extremely high. People are mass leaving other schools, private schools, to come to our schools because I remember those days when those existed. My daughter had that option of going to a private school and I said, nah, I'm sending her to public school because they're better than private schools. You get way more in the package. You get, you get the, the, the cultures of the people, along with the academics and the education. And we need to build that again here in St. Paul. Thank you. Omar? Well, it's, um, charter school is, um, I've been asked uh, everywhere I go. And I mean, same question. Um, the, the thing is that um, charter school is, is um, the district is costing if we have a lot of charter schools. And uh, we have to ask each other, or uh, district has to, uh, to ask each other, and says, why is our people are moving to charter schools? Because um, when I searched it and uh, looked at it, and most people are moving to charter schools is, for well, those are immigrant students, Im immigrant families. And, uh, so um, when I spoke to them, um, they're saying that they have a uh, teacher speaks their language. And they're saying they have a, 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 a transportation that driver has, a driver uh, speaks their language. So 
we need to figure out that um, the way we can hire you know, color teachers and also train our teachers uh, to um, cultural, uh, uh, cultural and, and difference. Thank you. The next question is about facilities. How do you propose addressing facilities budgetary challenges? Omar, you have this first. Again, the question is, how do you propose addressing uh, facilities budgetary challenges? Um, well, as a um, business owner, and we propose our budget every year and to figure out where, where we go next year. And uh, as a, um, the district is to figure out why is, is, is um, our budget higher, we, why we have our um, you know, deficit every year. And um, well, as a um, member, we, or, or business owner, I can figure out you know, where we have it, where, why, you know, where we have a gap, and where we have higher. And uh, we just need to look at what we have last year and what we have this year. And uh, where is, why is it our budget is higher? So we just need to figure out that. Thank you. Ryan? Um, I would like to have a little bit more board oversight involved on our um, committee for the review on what's going on with the expansions and or the overspending of the budget. And another important thing I think we could do is focus on where we need to spend our money. Do we need, I think a top priority is ADA accessibility. Make sure which schools do they have enough ADA accessible bathrooms. Are there wheelchair ramps near the exits where the students load for special ed buses? So I think a top priority is spending, like where do we need it? What are we specifically needing to spend it on? Um, you know, the Humboldt High School, there's a lot of stuff going on there that looks really great, really beautiful. But before we work for beauty, let's like focus on the minimums of what we need for accessibility for students need learning. A great, beautiful school is a great environment to learn in, but let's prioritize on what our focus is for accessibility for the needs of our students and prioritize our spending there so we're not you know, wasting money on uh, overpriced contractors for building new projects. Thank you. Thank you. Mizuki? I think uh, part of um, in the role of, of as board member trying to understand facilities and its scope and not realizing what was needed to monitor and understand each project um, in depth. And I, I will not say that the facilities plan is bad. I think updating spaces and to that point of making things ADA accessible, that, that has been happening with the additions and updates to buildings. And so I think that work is really important. The classrooms of 1999 and 1992 when I graduated, my high school still looks like that without any updates. And I believe that our students deserve facilities that will support them in a changing educational environment. That is important. I, I, I will not apologize for wanting our students to be in updated, um, flexible learning spaces. But to that point, that does mean that there does need to be more extended oversight on the board's part. And so that I will completely own. And, and again, I think that the spaces do need to be updated for our students. There are buildings that are 100, over 100 years old. Thank you. Chantel? All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I think just better oversight, you know, making sure that each phase has, uh, um, everybody is going over the numbers and making sure that we're, we're meeting our, our actual bid, making sure that we do research on people that are putting in bids, that they're actually capable of fulfilling that bid. Um, I work at Como High School right now, and so we're going through some of the, some of the things that were the, some of the construction, and I'm learning a little bit, you know. I see that, you know, we had a situation where, you know, you thought that you were just going to pull up a, a gym floor 
and put down a new gym floor, but there was like a couple other gym floors underneath there. And so things like that are not fitted into the budget and we need to figure out, I mean, now we're learning, I guess, and, and we're gonna figure out a way to make sure that we're staying within the budgets on these, on these um, facility costs and having proper oversight step by step though, not just kind of waiting and seeing, oh, the project's done, what's it look like? But step by step having appropriate oversight to make sure that we're staying within our budgets. Thank you, Steve. So just to echo what my colleague uh, Zucchiella said, I think we have to remember the purpose of what we're doing for operating our facilities and making sure that our faculty, that our students, that our community has the kind of learning spaces for our kids that they deserve. This is the largest building public works project in the history of the city of St. Paul and it is substantial, um, and it requires a lot of coordination and a lot of management. From the perspective of a board member, as we came onto the board four years ago, this facilities plan was put together in advance of our arrival. And when we came, we approved it and learned about it. Um, the ability of, I think there's some things that we need to focus on now. Uh, one is to make sure that the net cost to taxpayers hasn't changed. We made a commitment to the community about the cost of this, it should remain that cost. Second, we need to make sure that the capacity of the facilities department is there to manage the projects. Um, if it's not, then we need to have the staff that's in place to do that. Third, we need to make sure that the accuracy of costing is done properly so we know what to expect. And fourth, we need to make sure that our fiscal oversight is there for controls. As a board member, I have to rely on the staff to be able to make those choices. And if they cannot make those choices, then it's up to the superintendent to make some changes. Thank you. Jessica? Uh, so I would say, like others have said, better oversight, better communication, asking maybe better questions. Uh, we have to remember that four years ago when all of the incumbent board members were unseated, that there is kind of a huge loss of institutional knowledge and process that had happened there. So that's, I mean, that's, and, and figure out how do we make sure that we are passing on the information, asking the right questions. Um, and having good communication. And also having an expert who's worked on a project of this scale, like I don't know what, what happened when this was going on, but it seems like whether it's um, someplace in locally, metro area, or someone even you know, nationwide to find someone who's done something this big because there's so many moving parts. I also wanna say, I love beautiful buildings. I think schools should be beautiful. I think when we say things like what our kids deserve, what we have to remember is there are thousands of St. Paul kids who will not get these beautiful remodels. They will not have those because of these overruns. Theirs are gonna be delayed, and these are often, and most often, are some of our schools with the greatest amount of poverty. So we have to think about how those consequences are gonna affect those kids and when they get the spaces that they deserve. Thank you. Charlie? Could we pass one of the other mics over there? And could we get some assistance with one of the mics, please? All right, uh, so while I think that the spaces that our children go to day in and day out need to be fluid, I also think that we need to have better project manage and there needs to be better accountability. I think all of us up here have said similar things. Um, there needs to be better oversight and more transparency. We just need to do a better job of managing where that money's going and to have those milestones and to have those talks about where we are in a particular project so that we have the eyes and the ears to say this is going you know, sideways and we need to right side it so that it stays on budget. And we need to have some contingency plans that address the fact that there will be some uh, budgets that do go, the projects that do go over budget. Um, in a perfect world, that wouldn't happen, but we don't live in a perfect world, and so we need to think of every outcome, and uh, we need to be prepared for the fact that that might occur on some of these projects for our students, so. Thank you. This uh, question is a little bit long, so bear with me. How do you see yourself working for and with the students of St. Paul Public Schools, as well as engaging students in amplifying their voice and needs? I'll repeat that. Uh, how do you see yourself working for and with the students of St. Paul Public Schools, as well as engaging students in amplifying their voice and needs? The first person is Chantel. Of course it is. Oh, of course. <laughs> what? 
So this is kind of what I do. I, I, I make room, and then I push the kids, and then they have their voice. So um, I think the first thing, you know, as far as, like, tangible thing is I really want to see one of the SEEB students sitting up on the board with the rest of the school board. In Minneapolis, they have a student that actually sits up there and um, helps to make some of those decisions. So that would be the start. I want to see them see themselves in this in this power. And then I think through that process, it will, it will also mobilize a lot more students to bring their voice to the board. It will make people feel more welcomed on the board, more students welcome to the board meetings. I think me being on the board in itself is going to welcome students to the board meeting. Actually, a lot of students who aren't even engaged in school are kind of excited about what's going to happen at the, at the board meetings. Um, so I think this is just me getting in this space. I think it's going to be an opportunity. I think um, constantly building power with the kids, you know. Thank you. Jessica? We're making it work. We're making it work here. All right, so having gone to a lot of board meetings, I've become a really big fan of SEEB. And uh, a friend of mine who goes to a lot of these meetings with me, we often go to, when we see them presenting with such thoughtfulness and depth and clarity of purpose, I often say, or we say to each other, Maybe they should just kind of run some stuff because they are they are they are in the places thinking about the kinds of changes they want, and it's so exciting to see them. And, and it's those moments where you really feel good about St. Paul Public Schools, where you know that these kids are powerful and smart and awesome. And I love that my daughter, who's a sixth grader, whether or not she's on C, but just that this exists and the caliber and intellect of these students is, it's impressive and powerful. I would love to see SEEB, and I think this is something they've talked about, expanded, or sort of that student leadership expanded down into middle school. I was a middle school teacher. Um, I taught English, and I loved it. And middle school is my favorite time. Um, I know, I have one now, so it's a little different when they live with you, but when you're teaching them, <laughs> what you notice about them is they're still young enough to be kind of have this kind of joyful exuberance, but they're old enough to have really interesting thoughts and kind of seeing their purpose in the world. That would be a wonderful opportunity to get them engaged at that level. So we are cultivating them um, for that work um, at the high school level and beyond. Thank you. Steve? So I live with teenagers, and I know they have lots of opinions and lots of things that they think, and lots of wisdom and lots of knowledge, and they need lots of guidance. But one of the most profound things of being on the board has been working with our Student Engagement and Advocacy Board. It has been powerful to learn from them. It's been powerful to sit with them at the board meetings. Two members of SEEB sit at the board meetings at every meeting, or they have the opportunity to sit. We, we work on their projects, and they give us work and we give them work, and this kind of back and forth has been very powerful, and we've made some real concrete choices as a board. We changed our sc school resource officer contract because our SEEB students raised up the issue about how important it is to think about what we're doing and the relationships with police and schools. We changed our graduation dress policy because SEEB students brought that to us. So it's very powerful. I have seen it. I have grown in my own work as a board member because of the presence of students. And I know that there's a lot to do to extend that into the different buildings that we have. I would love to see it be expanded and grow more so we can make that happen in buildings and in district-wide even more than it is now. Thank you. Suki? So I... I am, I'm still trying to figure out um, other ways that we engage, not just with our SEEP students, but with our students across the district. And so uh, toward the end of the year, all of our seniors take the senior survey. And so one of the ideas I had was to do senior sessions. So I went to our high schools over lunchtime, sat down with our students and asked them questions about the survey, but then asked them about their experience in St. Paul and what they would tell upcoming freshmen. And as I was thinking about like, dang, I wish I would have thought of this sooner, then thinking what would I do for the fall that would be different. And so that is 
meeting our kindergartners who are, you know, now the big people, right? And no longer in pre-K, but then during our transition years. So our sixth graders who are leaving our elementary schools, right? And then our eighth graders. And I'm just like, okay, this is brilliant. So making it a point to visit our schools at the beginning of the year so I wasn't just the adult showing up at the end, that they would see me throughout the school year. Thank you. Hello. Ryan? Um, this is actually one of the issues that got me interested in running. One of my students was asking me why our holiday sessions are more towards uh, Christian holidays and students have to go to school on a lot of Muslim holidays. And I said, well, if you want to change that, you either need to become the president of the teachers union or go f run for the school board. She said, well, how do you run for the school board? I said, well, I'll go figure it out for you. And so, you know, we just kind of have to sh demonstrate, model, give these kids the opportunities. We can give kids those same opportunities on the lower level. Um, if you know programs like backpack tutoring or some sort of work study stuff, um, if it's possibility, kids maybe with advanced um, GPAs could possibly be allowed to work on some of our summer programs for younger kids. I mean, I know we, we try to focus on having staff that are older than 18 years old, but we could maybe look up some sort of opportunities where you can earn scholarships or work or just find some opportunities, whether it's tutoring, paid or not, or goes towards a scholarship. Just give kids the opportunity who are successful, successful uh, high schoolers, maybe help model elementary and middle schools, what they can do to be involved. Thank you. Thank you. Charlie? Uh, I think one of the ways that we can work and amplify and engage students is by creating relationships. Because if you create a relationship with someone, you're more willing to do better, right? Because you know that person. You'll be held accountable for that. I think we need to give students the resources that they need in order to get through school, right? School is not easy for anybody, right? There's a lot of things that happen between home and school, right? And having a trusted advisor or a counselor or someone that they can reach out to Right, will help a student do well in school. Uh, as a teacher myself, uh, education is uh, always kind of top of mind, right? But I work with all kinds of students from all different backgrounds, right? And they each have a valid voice and they each have a valid dream, right? And it's up to us as teachers, as school board members, to make that approachable for them so that it's not somebody making decisions about what I get to learn or what time I start school, right? That we all have a community voice that we're in this together Right? And if we're in it together, we're all looking out for everybody together. Thank you. Omar? Well, um, as a, um, you know, when I, where I grew up is um, education, is not, it, wasn't, it, not, it wasn't important. And uh, I come here and, um, and, you know, have a kids, and my son asked me one time, says, um, um, when you, why are you running on a school board? And he says, I, I says, oh, I mean, I'm, what do you think I'm running? He says, no, you want to make money? I said, no. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and I said, no, I'm running, I'm running to make better you know, education on St. Paul. And, uh, you know, to be, um, to bring the, you know, the kids to the um, uh, um, engagement of the, of the district is that kindergarten can do it. You know, my uh, uh, 11 years, uh, my 11 year old, uh, uh, fifth grade, and he speaks like an adult. And, uh, you know, so we can start on, you know, taking kids um, from uh, kindergarten to, to high school. Thank you. The next question In light of teacher shortages across the nation, what actions do you support to attract new teachers? and retain existing teachers. In light of teacher shortages across the nation, what actions do you support to attract new teachers and retain existing teachers? Jessica, would you like to begin this one, please? Uh, so this is my jam. I love thinking about, I, mean, I was a teacher, so I, I like thinking about creating conditions that teachers can thrive in. Um, happy teachers are good teachers, and teachers who are allowed to, to innovate in their classroom, who are allowed to innovate in their program, um, are more likely to stay. I, I spoke about that earlier. I also think we can look at, in terms of um, retaining, we can look at affinity groups 
and this can be, these can be racial or cultural, these could even be like where you are in your career. A new teacher has different needs than a teacher who's at the end of their career. They might be caring for an aging parent, they might be adapting to new technologies. Um, when, I, when I left teaching, I still had an overhead projector. If I had to use a smart board, it would take a really long, I mean, that would be the whole lesson would be me trying to figure out the smart board. So it's like, how are we setting teachers up to be successful? Because teaching's a really hard job. And so the more support we can offer to them through those kinds of groups, I think would be amazing. I also think there's a lot of work to be done at teacher prep programs to attract and retain and um, prepare teachers to be successful. Because if you feel like you can be successful, you're more likely to stay. Thank you. Steve? So I think, you know, the, it's the teach, our teachers are, are the most important adults in the building with our students every day. You know, we have to treat them with respect, elevate what they're doing, value what they're doing, and listen to what they have to say about what it is that they're doing, the wisdom that they have. So that's really important in terms of how we organize and, and do work in the building. And then when we think about in addressing teacher shortages, I'm thinking particularly about ways to bring in our, our paraprofessionals who are now in the buildings, who are there and can be part of the teaching core, who have relationships with our community, come from the community, know our students. How can we increase the number of people who are doing that? We have some programs within the district already, some with this university, University of St. Thomas, but we need more, and we need to make them more affordable and more accessible so that more students, more people can become students to become teachers uh, and smooth that pathway. The other thing is to also introduce this to our high school students as a pathway for our high school students to see this as something that they want to do. These are St. Paul students. Let's see how we can make it possible for them to see they can have a career as a teacher. Thank you. Mizuki? We have 37 educators, 37,000 educators currently in St. Paul, and they're our students right now. Um, that is how we will support our district and the state is the students who are currently in our classrooms. And that means that there is first and second and third order change to come, right? And so brace yourselves. Um, I, think part of, I think part of it isn't just attracting new teachers. It is who do we currently have in our school district who need to find that we need to help create the pathway for. Um, we have Souter, which is um, our uh, St. Paul Urban Teacher Residency with St. Thomas University, but there are other universities that um, we should have better partnerships with. I mean, that's just said and done. And it's not just having a partnership. What does it mean to support a new teacher in this district? And having been at Augsburg just a few months ago, there were teachers who were saying, I don't want to be a token that you need to hire. I need to feel like I'm supported and that this is a career that I can thrive in. And that is really so important. Thank you. Charlie? Uh, I think for our existing teachers, it's helpful for us to allow them to share their voice, share their ideas, share things that aren't working, help that they need, to give them a collaborative space so that they can be the best teachers that they want to be. Uh, I think we need to find those champions that exist inside each of our schools because they do exist, and I don't think enough is being done to support or uplift those individuals. And then I think... Um, regarding the new teachers that we onboard onto our schools, I think there needs to be some sort of mentorship program within the schools themselves. I mean, just think of your first job and the tasks that you were assigned. Wouldn't it have been easier if someone had been there with you to help you along the way, to collaborate with you, to give you some ideas, to tell you this is how I did it, I probably wouldn't do it this way again. I know I would have liked that, and I still like that. And so I think if we can create a more holistic approach to the way that teachers are viewed and the actual power that they have, because they are powerful individuals, that I think that will uplift the students and by succession then uplift the school board. Thank you. Omar? Um, um, I support that, I support the program that has a district, and, uh, but we need to uh, um, bring the, that program to the high schools and and also that um, um, ask the teachers that we have it right now and 
I have a neighbor uh, who is a teacher of, you know, St. Paul Public School. Um, is the teaching is not easy, and um, she is up until eleven at night, and she has to wake up at six. And um, so we need to ask them what we're missing, and also um, um, we need to visit um, high schools more time um, to um, tell them the program we have in in in, in the, the district. Thank you, Ryan. Um, one thing that may be good for attention is just having um, maybe more people in leadership sh uh, shallow, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sh shadow and go in some of the more difficult positions, um, whether it's board members or administrators. Have them follow the engineers for a day, custodians, and do their job. Have them ride on the special education buses. Have them do lunch duties. Um, another thing that I think would be a great idea is open up the opportunity for district employees to um, run for office. There is a state statute and a uh, district policy that echoes it, you know, if you make an over a certain amount, you can't also serve on the board. I think a good alternative is to update that policy and say, if you sir, if you run and are elected to serve on the board, uh, you should be allowed to take a, a leave of absence and come back to your job after after you serve, so you're not losing your job. You have something to come back to. Just r it takes a lot of courage for you know we have a, a candidate on the other end of the table who's an employee running. That's a lot of courage. It could upset your bosses. Um, it's a risky thing, so I think we should update our policy on leave or on serving on the school board to allow staff members to come back. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chantel? Um, I think that we have to just be honest and stop pointing the finger at our teachers and recognize that our system is what's broken and not our teachers. It's really bringing down the morale of our teachers and they're leaving out of the district. So that's our current teachers. Also lift the morale of the paraprofessionals. They're, they're working double time and they're not getting the recognition for it. They're giving a lot of the, um, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna use a term that's in the old, old uh, African proverbs, it's called the magic Negro. And um, that's basically what paraprofessionals are. We have all the information, the teachers come to us, the administrators come to us, they ask us the information and then they have bright ideas. We've gotta build the morale of all of the paraprofessionals. Um, and then I love the Suter program. I think it's probably one of the best licensure program that we have in our state right now. I love, I have never met a teacher that came out of that program that I didn't go, you are awesome. You're great at what you do. So I love that program. I would love to see it expanded. And I think if we build the morale of our paraprofessionals, they'd be willing to go get licenses and get into those programs. Thank you. Uh, what do you see as the role of school resource officers in the next four years at a time when youth do not trust people in uniform? This is the perspective of the writer. Um, and we'll begin with Suki. Um, I, have, I have struggled with the contract that we currently have. Um, for multiple reasons. Um, a lot of the conversation is that it is partnership. And to me, partnership is 50-50. And that is not what is currently happening. And I think when it, we're talking about relationships and how our students show up and feel like they can show up in classrooms and um, in, their, in their school, in their community, I, I really I really struggle with who do we believe our students are, what do we believe about SROs, and where do we believe their place is or isn't in our school. And I think that that conversation will continue to happen. There isn't a way for it not to continue to happen. I just, what do we believe about our kids that we have, our, have SROs, and what do we believe um, would be the alternative. Thank you. Jessica? So I've talked to um, administrators and teachers and staff in different buildings and there's definitely, and, and students, and there's definitely some places where they are satisfied with a specific SRO and how they conduct their work and they're happy to have them there. There are buildings where that is not the case. 
And I think the problem with the contract and the problem, what happens is there isn't an option for, stu for schools to say yes to this or no. And I think a, a reasonable compromise would be that if we want this role, if we define, if we're defining what this school resource officer role is in a community, the, the community should decide what that looks like. And if it is a uniformed police officer, okay. If it's a community-based solution, something different, okay. They should have the money to put towards that. They shouldn't, it shouldn't be like, well, you're on your own because you're not under the contract. They should be given access to funds to develop community solutions. Because ultimately, every community has a different need. And trying to have a one-size-fits-all when communication and investment and engagement in communities varies, that doesn't work. We have to trust our communities to find the solutions they need. Thank you. Charlie? Uh, if you look at the St. Paul School website and you pull up the SROs, there's little bios of each of the SROs that are in St. Paul. And one of the questions they ask each of these officers is, what's your greatest challenge or what things you have to overcome on a regular basis? And every one of those profiles says, I have to break down barriers because nobody knows what we do. And some people think that we're there for very different reasons than why we are. And so I think the SRO program, while maybe good in its um, invention, probably needs a reboot. And I envision uh, an SRO program where we pair counselors and therapists and other individuals that can ben better benefit our students with the issues and the, the different environmental issues that they might be going through to better solve the problems. If you interact with an officer in a not so good way, and then you encounter them at school, and school's supposed to be a great place to learn, how well do you think you're gonna learn? I just think there needs to be a change. Thank you. Omar? Um. Well, we, I've been asking the same question uh, each time I go outside or knocking doors. Is, um, well, is 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 a uh, SRO is um, is for community choice. That's what I describe. And um, is uh, if the uh, community think that um, SRO might be working for their side, then we have to look around, see if it's going to work or not. And um, um, it's not up. Uh, I mean, if the if the option that we'll have for the police in the school. Um, is where the where we gonna how we gonna pay it where will the budget will come, and we have to figure it out. And uh, if the community says that we wanted the, you know police in in, uh, in in the school, then that we have you know we have to look it around see where we can how we can get the budget, and uh, is that is that something that we can do it? And also is can we um, have a counselor instead of um, you know. Um, put in the uh, St. Paul in a public school, the uh, uh, police. But can we, ha can we have a, a counselor to have them, you know, uh, discuss what they need? Chantel? Um, so I'm at Como High School right now. So you guys are kind of, I'm sure you're not aware of things that are happening, but um, we just transitioned from one SRO to what I'll call a new SRO. Um, our previous SRO was a resource officer. He really focused on um, making sure that the kids had their needs, and he knew to keep himself out of situations, not trying to criminalize just an average kid argument. Um, we have a new one, uh, so there's good and there's bad. Because even with a good SRO, there's still documentation. And the reality is, is that there's nothing ever so major happening in the school that you can't call 911. You know, um, I've broken up many, I was at Ramsey at the peak of everything. I broke up many fights there. I broke up many fights at Como. It's not really that big of a deal. Kids are kids. They were kids when we were there and we were breaking up fights. They were kids when you guys were there and you guys were breaking up fights. They're kids now and they're just there, they, it happens. And we don't need to over-criminalize that situation and create the pipeline to prison. We should be creating a pipeline to success, and that's what I'm really trying to do. So if our SROs could come in as community members or social workers, that would be a, a better look than police officers. Thank you. Steve? 
I have to say this has been one of the hardest issues that I have found to deal with being on the board because every year we get asked to approve a contract with the police department and every year I feel like the questions get asked about how we can evolve beyond where we are right now where we've created a system where we depend on police officers in the district to be in our buildings. Every principal that I, we have talked to wants to keep that person there and yet we know how it works for so many of our students given their interactions with law enforcement, how it can have the effect of re-traumatizing those kids. And that is something that we have to be really mindful about. We have officers that are better trained than the average street squad in our schools, and that's a good thing. We do have officers that have been told and have been trained about de-escalation and some aspects of trauma, but they are still police officers. And part of the issue for me is, this is a very expensive contract. It costs us almost over $700,000 a year to fund this. And the split with the police department is 90% borne by the district. And what I believe is it does is it keeps the district from using resources to be able to fund alternative ways that we can do things. And we can't stop, stop. experimenting and doing it differently. Thank you. Ryan? Uh, I kind of want to combine a little bit and add to what uh, Chantel and Steve said. Um, you can probably a pit for four AEs, TAs, SEAs for the price of one SRO. Um, I'd rather have them breaking up fights and talking to kids. They can go for a walk, take the kid to the computer lab, take a walk outside to cool down. That's a lot less of an intense situation than a police handcuffing a kid or bringing them to a squad car. So the money we could save by alternatives to SROs are, are pretty helpful, a lot safer. Um, on our end, uh, we need to do help the teachers. I think we need to update some policies to say where kids go. There are some requirements that we need to have policies in place for removal of students from the classroom of who has custody of them and when they are removed for violence. So we kind of need to update those policies for teachers so they know where they can send a student who becomes violent instead of just going straight to calling the SRO and having the student arrested or handcuffed. Thank you. Thank you. The last question we'll have before closing comments is what are your funding priorities in the face of rising costs and limited funds. What are your funding priorities in the face of rising costs and limited funds? Charlie, you could go first, please. Uh, priorities in this order, uh, children, teachers, facilities. Um, I think, as I've stated before, doing this evening on my website, uh, children need, uh, those resources to be available to them when they need them. Uh, they need the schools to be able to provide them and they shouldn't have to seek them out on their own. I believe we've heard all too often from teachers that they don't feel valued and they don't feel that they can actually do the work that they were meant to do or that they want to do inside some of these schools. And I think being able to give them the power and the services and the resources to do that, to engage their students, to keep them active and whatever topic they might be discussing that day uh, is only gonna be helpful for the students but also helpful for the teachers. And then I think uh, facilities kind of as a, um, a last priority um, though not the least priority because all facilities need to be available and created for the use of all of our students and they need to be fluid because our uh, economy is changing but so is our educational landscape. Thank you. Masuki? Can you repeat the question? Certainly. Um, what are your funding priorities in the face of rising costs and limited funds? Uh, students, 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 students. Um, I, curr I currently sit on the Minnesota State School Board Association, and that is school board members that are represented across the state. And we can't talk about um, priorities without talking about funding for education across the state. And that is not just the work of St. Paul, that is school districts across the entire state saying, you need to fund, fully fund our schools because we cannot support our students if we're not doing that. And so I will continue to do that work at a state level. I will continue to listen to our students and uh, try and amplify their voices as much as possible and support our, support, support our teachers and our paraprofessionals and our building engineers and our nutrition service workers 
All of these people who work with our students every single day matter, and trying to make sure that we are listening to them and letting them know that we care about them, we respect them, and that they matter. It is really important work. Please and that stop. is just- Please stop. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I wasn't paying attention to the red. No problem. Um, Jessica? Stop, stop. stop. <laughs> Uh, so, well, this is a hard question because there's so many, so many priorities. So um, some things that I think, you know, in my experience in the classroom as a teacher, when I think about like setting kids up to be successful in the classroom, I think about um, the kinds of things that help build relationships. So when we talk about social emotional learning, that's a kind of, it's kind of a buzzword and I, and, and I, and I hesitate to use things like that because it's, it's really just relationships and it's really helping kids um, identify how they're feeling, giving them some tools to, to deal with things. I know at my daughter's school they had this um, where you could be in the green zone. There were, it was like zones of regulation and it works so well at school like we use it at home. So like if I come home and I'm like mom's in the red zone and I'm gonna put that on the refrigerator so like everybody knows. But it gives you tools to deal with that because if kids come in and whatever's happened at home, on the bus, you know, in the hallway, it's like we have to help them be able to reset and get ready to learn. And so any money going towards that, any money towards restorative practices, because school is a place where like, you should be able to make a mistake and then you should be able to be able to repair it, repair the harm, and come back to learn. And so those are the kinds of things I would love to see in every school fully funded because that sets our kids up for success. Thank you. Chantel? So <clears throat> because of what's happening in our society right now, I think the number one thing we need to do is address trauma in the classroom, address the urban trauma that's happening in the communities and coming into the classroom. Um, I would like to see all of our paraprofessionals be trained in urban trauma so that they can deescalate triggers that happen. Um, I don't know if any of you guys saw the video that just occurred a few days ago at the corner store, but there was a nine-year-old boy in dead shock watching a dead body and he had to go to school the next day. And when he put his head down, his teacher said, get up, you need to pay attention. The teacher needs to be aware of these things. We also need to invest more in restorative practices. Um, I'll tell you another quick story. Today I had a kid, he was on his way out the door. I had just met him earlier in the day, but he was on his way out the door. I said, what's up bro? She wrote me a referral for nothing. Wait a minute, a referral is not, you're not in trouble. Let's just go talk about it. He, he was adamant because through his life, Every time he got a referral, he was in trouble. In our school, it's Please restorative. Stop. I just want you to grow and Please become stop. a better person through your, through your wrong actions. Thank you. <laughs> Steve? Oh, so much to say. Um, so a few different things. One, I, um, we don't well, write in a blank slate. We have a strategic plan that we have at the district. And so we have to look at the strategic plan and make some choices based upon those priorities. Those priorities were in response to the things that we as a board heard in community and were raised up to our administration. So they include a lot of things around staffing and support and uh, you know, culturally relevant education and college and career pathways, all of these things. For me personally, uh, I think things that are direct instruction, direct support in the classroom, things that help our students deal with what they're dealing with. So mental health supports, nurses, social workers, folks who can be in the building to work with our teachers to support our students, to help our students. Also, staffing and practices that deal with culture change, funding things like restorative practices. We put money towards that as board members in one of the contracts that we settled with the teachers union. It is paid benefits and we need to expand that into other places and spaces. Uh, and we need to push back on the scarcity mentality like my colleague was talking about. We have funding, we need to use it in the right way. Thank you. And Omar. Um, my three priority is that um, students. Number one is students. And um, do we have a, a, a right transportation? And how we do in our classes? And um, uh, number two is teachers. Um, teaching, again, teaching is not easy. And our teachers has to be paid better and has to have a, a better equipment. And uh, number three is building. Our building is, is well equipment. Uh, how is that, are the you know how is our classes? And um, it has to be um, make sure our building is, is well maintained. 
and uh, and uh, classes is well maintained. Thank you. In closing, we apologize if your question was not answered. Um, thank you. I have a couple issues that I think on um, are important for budgets and funding. Um, so one thing we do to gain revenue for special education services is third-party billing. Um, through Minnesota Health Care Program, parents can consent to their students' um, special education service provider um, services be billed to this insurance provider. We need to make sure we have the trust of the parents, the trust of the staff that are doing this. It's a big part of paying for our special education services. We have to make sure we're getting it right, make sure the parents trust us, make sure the staff that are doing it trust what they're being directed to claim. So just kind of keep an eye on that. Um, transportation is an issue we have to watch for in the future. You can make more money delivering three pizzas and 70 kids, like 10 more bucks an hour. So we are going to be facing huge uh, bus driver shortages. Bus drivers have a special class of license, and they are federally required to pass drug tests. So these are a higher quality employee. We're going to lose them to Jimmy John's or Papa John's. So we need to really be ready for how we're going to train transportation, how we're going to be watching our transportation costs in the future. Uh, another you know, major thing is following the uh, facilities plan and keeping that and prioritizing it. Thank you much. Thank you, and I apologize. Um, in closing, uh, we apologize if your question was not asked. We can never get to all the issues in a limited format such as this. We encourage you to speak to the candidates at the close of the forum. The closing statements will be given in the reverse order from the opening statements. Please remember you have two minutes to conclude your remarks. First is Zuki Ellis. Um, it is my honor and my privilege to serve on the school board in the district that raised me. I am exactly who our students can, should, and will be. Um, I have taken this work to heart. Um, there are 37,500 souls in this district. And um, I don't sleep well at night because I'm always wondering about what we could have done better, what we can do better, and what we should be doing better. And I am committed to continuing to do better for our students and our people who work in this district. I do not believe by any stretch of the means that this job is what I thought it would be. Um, I thought that most of it would be really very student focused. And I feel like a lot of it is sort of managing adults. And uh, that is not what I thought it would be. Um, I have great love for this community. I have great frustration with it. I am in the school district and have great frustration in the role that I have. Um, as a black woman, being in the spaces that I have to navigate on behalf of our students, I am in, a, for instance, Minnesota State School Board Association, and I am the only person of color on that board in, a, in the state of Minnesota. In the state of Minnesota, take that in. And when you think about how diverse our state is, when you think about our students who are global and world, Remember that there is only one school board member that is represented, that is representing our students on, in, at a state level that's a black woman. And that is not okay. It will never, ever be okay. And so I do this work because I have, I have been elected to do this work and I do this work um, with great belief in the possibilities for our students and their brilliance and their genius and hoping that this district will continue to thrive to um, create opportunities for them to see themselves in this world. Thank you. Ryan? Thank you very much. Uh, running has been a great opportunity for me. I'd like to encourage you all to run for something in the future, whether it's school board or state office or any city council. Um, it's a great opportunity. This has given me the opportunity to speak to you know, four of our next school board members. I've spoken with um, uh, current board members who aren't running again. Um, there's a couple former board members in the office in the room here that I've only met through events like this. Um, you get invited to organizations like this to speak to crowds of people and get your issues out there. So I really recommend that give it a shot yourself, or if not, join a campaign of somebody you like. It's a really great opportunity. You can get your message out there. It's it's really great because you know I've gotten a chance to meet f uh, four people yes. or three people and that are gonna be on the school board. And that's a great chance to, you can always check in with them, say, hey, we talked about this, here's what I was saying, would you be willing to follow up on this? So you can meet former people, current people, it's a really great opportunity. 
you you just get so you go you get the DFL conventions, you get these events, you get um, chances to speak in the press. So please, please consider running your, running in two years or four years or uh, joining a campaign in two years. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Omar. Thank you, everyone. Uh, um, again, um, it's to have it's, it's a pleasure to to have you here tonight and uh, and. Uh, I am running uh, St. Paul School Board, and as I said, I, um, I was born in Somalia and left the country in 1991, and I come here that um, place that has much opportunity here. And um, I, uh, I am running because of, uh, uh, we just wanna make sure that um, our school um, serve all community. And um, um, we've been, you know, we've been, you know, in, we started our campaign in, you know, um, uh, uh, and last year, and uh, um, we've been doing campaign, but but we running because of the um, uh, as an immigrant, we are running as a um, you know uh, as a, a community, and we we need you we need your uh, you know you vote and uh, November fifth and uh, consider it. And I thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, thank you. There is so much I want to say to you. There's so much more we didn't get to talk about, and I just want to encourage you. I'd love to chat with you after this. I'd love to chat with you another time. I will come have a cup of coffee, even though I don't drink coffee. I will find something. I will have a donut. And because um, talking about schools and how they shape our communities, how how you all and whoever of the sub seven, eight of us, whoever's up here, um, are on the board, like that's a partnership. That's work we do together. Um, so I wanna keep the conversation going. So I'm just gonna remind you that I'm a former educator, middle and high school English teacher. I'm a parent of a St. Paul Public School middle schooler, and I'm a school-based advocate. I had a lot of experience advocating for my school community, which was a high poverty, majority student of color program that had a level three EBD program. If you're not familiar with that, sometimes those programs, just parenthetical, those are almost always placed in our poorest school communities. So when we talk about changing structures of racism, we, we, we talk about what that looks like, how that shows up. When we place those programs in those schools, we're telling kids what we expect, who we expect to be in those programs. And so I can bring, a, you might look at me and not think I have that perspective, but I do, because that was my school community. And so I understand the broad ranges of experiences that staff have, that students have, and um, that families have. I think every student in every school should be, be well taught and well loved. It shouldn't matter who they are or where they are. We shouldn't have a few good schools that we all clamor to get into. We should have excellent schools in every community. Every family deserves that. My priorities are to have a more engaging, welcoming and accessible board to build up our community, city and county partnerships, partnerships to work with the district and to support diverse and innovative teaching and learning. I ask for your support on November 5th. I wanna continue the conversation with you and I definitely wanna be in partnership with you as neighbors to make St. Paul Public Schools amazing for every St. Paul kid. Thank you. Thank you, Chantel. Um, I am super excited to be running for school board um, just on the mere fact of being able to bring the voice of the people that are in the schools, in the classrooms, the students and the teachers uh, at, at, on this platform. I really, I'm excited if I get an opportunity to sit on the board, I'm gonna be excited to bring those voices to the board continuously so that we can always have a perspective of what's really going on in our schools. Um, I'm gonna keep it real short and sweet, you know. Um, I was born and raised in St. Paul a lot of us here look like we're, you know, we've been around for a while. Me, I've been around, I'm 45. And I, I remember the days when St. Paul was that beautiful city that we could all work together on. And, and I believe that our schools can start to produce those same type of citizens and we can start to rebuild our city so that it's a safe place and so that it's equitable for everybody. Um, I believe that our school system can provide an equitable education for everybody in our city, no matter how diverse it is. 
And I think that we just need to really bring the voices of the people into the leadership spaces so that we can start to merge that together and start to build the vision that we see every day. You know, and, and that's all there is to it. You know, I, I, I believe in St. Paul. I believe in our schools. I believe in our teachers. And I believe in our administrators. I think that we have really good teachers in our building and we have really good administrators. We just have a broken system. And we need to really just restructure the way our system is set up and how we start to look at our students and, how, and, and what we start to do with them and giving them the opportunities that they deserve. And that's it. Thank you. Charlie? So first, I want to thank everybody for attending. Uh, I think events like this allow us as candidates to provide a bit of transparency about what we stand for and why we're running, uh, but also to field your questions. What are your concerns? Uh, what keep you up at night? How do you see the forward path of St. Paul, St. Paul schools, teachers, and students? Um, I don't claim to have all the answers, um, but education really gets me fired up. As a teacher myself, I always tell people it's the job that takes the most amount of time, but at the end of a semester or the end of a year, I can look back at my notes when that student first walked into my classroom to the day that they leave, and I can see the progress that they've made, and I can see the better person that they've become for the experiences that they've had in my classroom, for the failures that they had, because they can make mistakes and they can learn from those. How many times have you done things right, but if you make a mistake, you learn the most from them? Teachers that are willing to sit with students before school, after school, during office hours, after, uh, on the weekends. Um, being able to create that sort of environment is why I'm running for St. Paul School Board. Uh, my vision for St. Paul is that students, when they come in to St. Paul schools, any of our public schools, are told and they believe that they can be whatever they want because that was my vision when I was a little kid. I told you I was going to be a chef and then a painter, and I'm not any of those. My vision is also that when they walk across that graduation stage, when they leave St. Paul schools and they're ready to enter the workforce or they're ready to go to college or whatever else their future holds for them, they are told and they believe that they can do anything because the power of education means that you can do anything. And as I was thinking about coming here tonight and talking to all of you and giving you my answers, I'm, reminding of the, I'm reminded of the fact that Senator Paul Wellstone said it best when he says, we all do better when we all do better. If we think about putting every single student in the driver's seat of their education, we can make St. Paul, as some of my um, counterparts have said here today, we can make St. Paul the school district that we want it to be, that people flock to, that come to, and that aren't leaving in droves. And I think that's the ultimate vision for anybody that sits up here or decides to engage in their community. And I thank you for the conversation tonight. Thank you. Steve? You know, in this time, in this political time, in this time in our community, when we have such trauma going on, it has been a real privilege to be on the St. Paul School Board and work on things that I care about in my home. Um, not only because I'm a parent and I have kids in the school district, not only because my son's friends who sit at my kitchen table depend on St. Paul Public Schools or the kids that they play music with or play basketball with, but it's because it's the future of the city that we're talking about and it's the future for my children and the future for my neighbors and for all of our kids that we're dealing with right now. Um, this is also very personal because for me, public education is how I got to be sitting here. I was the first in my family to go to college because I grew up at a time when public education was invested in and that made it possible for me to go to college and get become a lawyer and work on social justice and then take that, that experience other places. Um, we have such great potential in this district, but we also need to be very smart and very strategic and very focused about the resources that we have. St. Paul, for all that it has as a history, is in deep transition, and we need to have a school district that reflects the transition that our community is going to and becoming the kind of city that we want it to be. And it starts with creating a school district that reflects what we want, that is the best of our city, and we can do it, and we're starting to do it. We have a superintendent who is very hardworking and very focused, and he is starting to do it. And more importantly, we have teachers and we have staff, whether they are paraprofessionals or custodians or lunch folks who care deeply about our kids. And we have families who are putting everything into our school buildings when they let our, their children cross that front door. 
at our job as school board members, when we're answering emails, when we're going to school functions, when we're staying up at 10 or 11 o'clock at night at the school district, and let me tell you, people don't even ask me to do things on Tuesday nights anymore because they know where I am. And they also sometimes don't even ask me to do other things on other nights because they know where I am. Where is it? It's at a school board function. This is important work. You put your heart and soul in it. I'm committed to making this work. I'm committed to seeing the work through. And I would love your support to be able to do that. Thank you. I would like to remind the audience that the views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates and not those of the sponsoring organizations, the League of Women Voters, Union Park District Council, and St. Paul Neighborhood Network. On behalf of the sponsoring organizations, I would like to thank the candidates for being part of this forum and recognize them for serving their community through participating in the democratic process and running for public office. I would also like to thank the audience here in McNeely Hall at St. Thomas University. And at home, for watching the candidates discuss issues that are important to your community. Every vote does count. This year, election day is on Tuesday, November 5th. The polls are open from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. Early voting is also an option. Please remember to take a friend and a neighbor and vote on Tuesday, November 5th. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>